Joining me today is one of Australia's best known social entrepreneurs. Please welcome the founder of Oz Harvest, Ronnie Khan. Ronnie, thanks very much for joining us. Such a pleasure to be here. It's lovely. Actually, the last time we spoke was at the conference at yes. uh, the All Market Summit. So that was that was great too. But one of the things, one of the things you said actually at the conference was, you know, you're on to a great idea for a business when people around you are really excited about it. And so for you with Oz Harvest, was that what you found back in 2004? Absolutely. It was extraordinary. First of all, naive. I'd never started a charity. I'd never considered starting a charity. But what I knew was there was food. And I figured, I knew there were people in need. And when I started saying to people, I would connect good food with people in need, it was like, yes, what do you need? I was a bit like the Pied Piper. I had yeah. people coming <laughs> and saying, what do you need? And really? those people that said, oh, it'll never work. I just said, mind out my way. Not interested in you guys. Yeah. But there were so many who just loved that notion. Where did you come up with that notion? So in my business life, I was an event producer and kept putting on wonderful, beautiful events. And the thing that is absolutely common to an event yeah. is food. Food is about dignity, it's about sharing, it's about showcasing generosity and abundance. So all of my events, whether they were corporate or private, there was always an abundance of food. Yeah. And the end of the event would come. We were often in unique venues, mostly in unique off-site venues mm. and late at night the caterers would just come and just turf that food. It was happening again and again until one day I woke up and thought this is insane and started collecting it myself when I could and dropping it off at one charity that I knew. So you were still working in the events and you went out and said, okay, I'm not actually going to let this be thrown out. I'm going to bring this over to the oh, charity. Yeah, yeah I, I stayed working in my event business for the first seven years of Oz Harvest. Oh, did you? And the reason that's important is because I've had so many people over the last 15 years say, you know, one day when I've got enough money, when I've got time, when my kids have grown up, when I've paid the mortgage, when I then I will do something. Yes. And the truth is, I didn't start Oz Harvest because I was bored or rich. I started it because I needed to know why I was on this planet. Yeah. And I knew that there was food and there were people in need. But I couldn't afford to stop working. So I worked for the first seven years in my business while building Oz Harvest. Yeah. Until I won an award that actually allowed, in, insisted that I work full-time in the charity of my choice. They offered me a salary of $50,000. And I decided it was time to dive without the parachute. Absolutely. So you and won. I closed my business. So what was the award that you won? So in, in 2009, it was Vodafone World of Difference. And it was a most extraordinary award. And it's a such a tragedy that it no longer exists. So it was a game changer for you? It was a game changer for me and for the others that had won in the years previously because it's the only organization that pays for capacity. They said, we will pay you $50,000 mm -hmm. to work for the charity of your choice because they loved what I'd created. Brilliant. But that's all you can do. You can't do your other job. That's what you focus on. So you left. You left. I your, left a business that business. sometimes could have made fifty thousand dollars on a weekend, wow. but to a fifty thousand dollar yep. annual salary. Yeah, that was the best thing I ever did. Amazing. You yep. knew. You knew in your heart. I that knew was it. that this was my time, and I figured I'd worry about it at the end of the year. What would happen? But what happened during that year was that Oz Harvest just catapulted, having me full time and not diverted yeah. to running my business and trying to run it on the side. But to go back, to, was there a seed, like was there something in you from like say childhood? You grew up in South Africa and then you moved to Israel and lived yeah. in a kibbutz for a while. I did. You did. Tell me a bit about that and some of the philosophies you took from that. Yeah, so the beautiful philosophy about living on a kibbutz is it is a socialist ideology in that everybody works according to their ability 
and gets according to their needs. So there's no financial transaction. There's a dining room, you go and eat. Yeah. There was a little store if you wanted a few extras and you had like bingo coupons that you'd go and trade for soap or trade for something a little different. Yeah. Um, it, it is an extraordinary existence, but it's challenging if you're an entrepreneur. And even though I didn't know that word then, yeah. didn't know how independent I was, you get told where you're going to work. I didn't always want to work where they told me to work. Okay. Anyway, it was an experience. But the thing that unites that with anything else that led me to Oz Harvest, because you asked the question, did I always know that I wanted to yeah. do something? Absolutely not. Oh, no. I thought you were going to say absolutely. <laughs> absolutely not. Yeah. Which is really important for anyone else to hear. Mm. Because... I didn't grow up striving and thinking one day I'm going to be a Change charity that. queen. One day I'm going to do this. Yeah. Not at all. I was a spoiled little girl growing up. Didn't know. But what I was embedded with were values, values about equality, values about how to treat people. Mm. And I guess that again came out in my life on kibbutz. And then I left kibbutz to just make a living, mm. put a roof over my head, food on my table. Yeah. Until I reached that point that I knew what it was like to have food on my table and be independent. Because when you say yeah, so when you say that you didn't know growing up or you didn't have this like a vision of becoming a charity like a charity queen. But you had those inner values. So a lot of people who are, say, working in the corporate world will be thinking to themselves, I have to do something something else. So in that sense, do you think it's never too late to start something? Or do you think, how, do you, how can you find that sort of purpose? So there are two questions there. there the are one two, is... Probably three. <laughs> it's, yeah, probably more, but I'll, I'll answer the two. The one is, it is never too late. There is no time. There only is the time to be doing what it is you're meant to be doing. The second one is about finding purpose. And mm. I have so many people come to me almost desperate to find purpose. I'm very mindful of using that word. Oh, really? Well, it's I am. It's In 2003, thing. you could really talk about finding purpose. Today, people almost feel, can I find it on the supermarket shelf? Where can I go and find it? Mm. But actually, it is an internal thing, and it doesn't have to be called purpose. And in truth, I think every single one of us can find value and can find what it is that is a driver beyond a salary. And I believe that everyone can find that, whether it's in their work or whether it is by stepping outside of their work, because Lord knows. The one thing we don't need is more charities. There are 70,000 charities in Australia. Yeah. 70,000, many of them competing with each other. Mm. So the question is, that isn't the only way to get fulfilled. Because I happen to be particularly fortunate that I came up with an idea that nobody was doing. Yeah. And there was a gap. And there was a need, which is an extraordinary thing. Absolutely. And if somebody comes up with that, absolutely go for it. Mm. But if there's somebody doing something almost identical to that idea, go and offer them your help. Go and be that extraordinary support to that. Volunteer your time. Volunteer your energy, your ideas. Yeah. And be the very best you can be in your day job by doing random acts of kindness, yeah. goodness. So, so you, know, you don't have to go have and start grown up saying, one day I want to be. Yeah. Today Dude. is that day. True, true, true. With Oz Harvest, so how, did you, so how did you get it off the ground? How did I scale it? How did I get it yeah. off the ground? So like a mad person, like a lunatic, I ran around saying, I'm going to start a food rescue organization and I'm going to take good food and deliver it to people in need, literally. Yeah. Like like a passionate mad person, which most people would say I still am, <laughs> but that's besides the point. And the truth is passion is infectious. Yeah. 
and people want to be part of something. They will follow. And so they followed. So I was led from one door to the next, opened a door that said, go and ask them for seed funding. I never asked for seed funding. I didn't even know what the concept meant. I'd run my own business. I'd never had to ask anybody for anything. Yeah. I'd built up a business by delivering amazing, delivering what I'd promised. Yeah. And, and, and so I guess there was something trustworthy about me that when I said I'm going to take food and deliver it to someone in need without a business plan other than what was written on a napkin, Yeah. they said, okay. But at the time, there was legislation around not being able to give food away. So if you left over food, but you helped change that legislation. I did have to because initially there were many people who came on board and said, that's divine. We're going to give you food. But at the time that I started, I didn't realize the scale of the problem. I didn't know that a third of all food being produced was going to waste. I thought, my little world, I'll just get all the event producers and rescuing get them to food. This. Yeah. And then I discovered, of course, in supermarkets everywhere. So to get the major supermarkets, the major food suppliers on board, when I went to them, they said, no way. We can't give you our food because we're worried about our liability. Liability. So, so I figured, okay, well, then what it. we have to do is make it easy for them. Yeah. And that's what we did. We had laws changed. Yeah. Every single person probably here knows that how much food we throw into that. You yeah. go out grocery shopping, it's in the fridge. And then I feel bad every time I do it. On an individual level, yeah. how do we get consumers to, firstly, to, to realize how important yeah. it is not to waste so much food? Or what, what sort of impact would we as consumers have? Yeah. That is such a divine question because yesterday I had someone say to me, you know what, if I have a shower that's too long, it's in that same vein. Yeah. Or if I take a bite of my apple and throw it away, what is what is just my little effect? I know. And the challenge is that a third of all food that goes to waste, a third of the third of all food that goes to waste is coming from us, is coming from households, is coming from individuals. And I'm, and and the beautiful part is we are the solution. And every single one of us by valuing food by being more mindful. For example, if you made a shopping list before you went shopping, Mm -hmm. you would buy what you need. Now, you might have three tins of beans in your cupboard. Yeah. But if you didn't check and you went shopping, you'd stand there and say, oh, when you're in front of the beans, maybe I need beans. I'll just grab a can. Or I can't remember if the oranges, if there's still an orange or not. And you'd buy oranges. Or you'd buy lettuce. You yeah. know, those are the things that go to waste the most. But I saw, so the survey out that we did a story on last week was yeah. about um, Australians in general, they throw out about $1,000 worth of food every year, roughly. <clears throat> in right, Well, there's some research that says it's three and a half thousand. Well, I probably, yeah, I probably believe yeah. that. Yeah. Um, but then young people are the worst offenders. Yeah. And, but they, they're the most environmentally conscious. Yeah. So do you think the likes of, Will we be able to shift their mindset? Like the likes of Uber Eats and Deliveroo, you say, oh, I'll just order something rather than go. Well, you know what's so stunning is that a show like this is is giving a voice to the fact that every single one of us does make a difference. And we have to shift our behavior. We have to value food. We have to remember that every time we buy food and then order Uber Eats in and throw away what we've got, that it does make a difference because until we take personal responsibility yeah for this problem instead of saying why doesn't somebody fix it the somebody starts with us yeah and it's 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 us sharing that message that yes you count and i count and you count and you count when i was growing up I don't think we'd ever waste any food. My mother would say nothing would be wasted. We're getting worse. We are getting worse because we are, we, we want convenience Mm. and we have so much around us. We're a consumptive society. It all seems to be so readily available. And so it is going to take self-control. Yeah. It is going to understand that we are reaching a point of which there will be no return, that our planet will not be able to cope 
if we continue throwing away food and not valuing food. There is enough for all of us. There is. There's more than enough. But at there the, is but, more than enough. And we're looking at, by 2050, we're going to have a population of like 9 billion. And there's enough food to feed us yeah. if we look after it. Yeah. And it's each and every one of us. It isn't somebody else's problem. It is ours. So when you say what is going to shift and change our behavior, it is us those of us who are in that know, sharing that message with their mates. Yeah. When you're about to order and you have just bought food, say, oh, say don't go in there. Let's just, let's not do that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it is going to take all of us. Yeah, I agree. I don't do it, but I agree. No, because I know. I, I know, and it is because when we're, I was thinking about this before today, I was, I was feeling very bad. <laughs> I was, I was well, feeling very bad. from feeling bad, comes that next action yeah. well, you can feel hopefully you'll get to feel so bad that you say it's not <laughs> good enough to feel this bad yeah what can I, I do, do and something. it's just each if each of us took one action seriously yeah because you don't realize the impact that that like that bin full of food I, exactly I, yeah. this guy saying if so, I don't have a short shower how will I you know my little saving of water well that's what's going to make the difference. So Australia, we produce, I couldn't, I could be wrong here, but like we, we, I think it was 93% of our own food. But because yeah. of drought at the moment and um, environmental factors, that's going to be impacted. Totally. Do you think the government's doing enough to no. address this? And what no. do you think needs to happen? What would help? What year? All of us making a noise because the government is there because we put them there. And they are not looking after us in our best interests. They are looking after their own interests. Yeah. And until we start demanding more from our leaders, from our politicians, that they will carry on doing and getting away with not giving us what we need. Yeah. Because and I because I think it's about in terms of food security here, we don't realise as well how many people actually have Five million. Five, Five million, million people in Australia. Australia. In, a, in a population of 24 million? It's well, insane. You, so when you talk about food security, we're talking about, can you just explain? Yeah, it's, we're it's talking about nuts. people who need food relief at some point, either once a day or a couple of times a week, who have to make choices mm. about either paying something yeah. and therefore going without food yeah. in order to survive the month yeah and That's some it. people not even having the capacity to make those choices yeah it's five million australians in this generous exquisite it's country good country yeah there's a target to half the amount of food waste in australia by 2030 yeah so do you are you confident that you no. can do that you're not no okay. i'm not confident i can't do it by myself no i am confident if every one of us commits to supporting that notion, and that together we have food waste. What What's something that would scare the living daylights out of people to say, wow, like, are there some facts and figures that you could th throw out to people to say, to get people, to galvanise people into action and actually redo really something? Because people kind of float along and don't do much. Yeah, you know, the quality of the food we eat will be affected. The variety of the food we eat will be affected. Yeah. There will not be enough food. I mean, who could imagine that? We don't imagine yeah. that we, you know, if we continue to walk into a supermarket and buy cherries when they're not in season yeah, and buy not local, we will find we won't have. that we will not have. Yeah. And, and you know, it's very hard for us to conceive of that. You're yeah. right. Well, look back, say, and telling your grandkids, like, you know, oh, once upon a time, we used yeah. to go out and order these well, things well, from a exactly, restaurant. You know, we waste the equivalent of 180 tons of food a week yep. here in Australia. That's what we're collecting. Yeah. That's actually not what's being wasted. Yeah. It, it's like two blue whales. Imagine two blue whales worth of food yeah. being wasted every week. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's scandalous.
a lot of companies now, the big corporates are all talking about purpose now and yeah. it's, a, it's a good shift, but. Yeah, it's very important. It is important. You do the CEO cook-off and yes. then, so this gives, do you, do you, are you finding that there's a shift now to, to in the last 15 years for CEOs and um, leaders to want to do more for purpose, uh, work more at uh, charities? Yeah, you know, the truth is when you're in a leadership role in a business, there are expectations of you. And one would hope that leaders are authentically about running the best company, giving back to society, making their staff feel proud of living and breathing the work of those, those companies. Yeah. And sometimes it's very hard to show that in your everyday work. Yeah. What we found with the CEO cook-off it's not even about leading with purpose because, quite honestly, there shouldn't be a leader that isn't leading without purpose. Yeah. But there's so many gala dinners. There's so many events that really make leaders feel even more important. And, and I'm sure that's why they're very popular. Our event is actually the exact opposite of oh, that. Oh, because you flip it, yeah. It's the tables are turned. Our event, we do ask leaders to raise money. They have to raise money because we have that's our flagship fundraiser. Yeah. But what we ask them to do is to come on the day to roll up their sleeves because, in fact, they're going to be sous chefs in a kitchen of one of Australia's 40 or 50 top chefs. Yeah. So business leaders come in. They get put in a group with a chef. And they're serving people in need. So our guests, yes. our VIPs on the night, yeah. are 1,300 of the people that on a daily basis we walk past and don't see. Yeah. They're invisible. We don't want to look at them. Yeah. Those are the guests. So if you're in a leadership role and you actually go and do that, how inspiring is that? And how much did you raise at the last year? We raised two point. Eight million. Wow. My goal yes. this year is three million. Okay. But the beautiful thing is this year we're inviting leaders to come in with a team of five. Yeah. So it's not even just saying, I'm a great leader. It's saying, I'm a great collaborator. Mm. Come in with me. You experience with me mm. and help me and help us raise money mm. so that we can break bread and share a night that is truly humbling. It is truly. So when's the it's next on the thirtieth of March, twenty twenty. We're okay. in the rego mode right now. Anybody hearing this can go online to Oz Harvest www.ozharvest and, and and put in CEO Cookoff and register. Fantastic. Yeah. We Thank have you. got um, questions coming through here from the audience. Awesome. So I'll just ask someone. Ask. This is from Elizabeth and she says, what do you think are the most valuable qualities young people should be striving for today? What a beautiful question. It's lovely. I think it's about living an authentic and real life. I do think it's really important and nobody is denying how important it is to earn money. But you don't want to be earning money on the back of somebody else. So living an authentic, real life to me means working, being of value to the company, but being sure that the company is giving value back to everyone in it mm -hmm. and to the wider community. So if you're in an organization that really doesn't align with your values, I would say life is really short even when you're young and you think you've got the rest of your life. You've got to be, life is short. All we have is right now true. That's to be the true. best you can be. How does one um, change laws and legislation? What is the response from government during this process? So I will share with all of you that I did not do that by myself. Uh, no, I didn't, yeah. But I got a bunch a of player. pro bono lawyers. So I, <laughs> yeah. I inspired lawyers to, to tell me what it's going to take. Yeah. So is it easy? No. But ultimately, those in government are there to serve us. Mm -hmm. And so if you're the biggest pain in the neck, and if you lobby, and if you don't let people off, yes. they finally listen. If they think it's in their interests. Yes. That is this very weird dilemma. Yeah. And so what it took was 
a bunch of great minds supporting an idea Fantastic. and not letting go. Yeah, persistence. Yeah, persistence, Dog resilience, persistence. and not giving up. Brilliant. What kind of impact has your NEST program had on communities? And can you just explain what NEST sure. is as well? So our NEST program is our nice, easy, simple tips or nutrition, education, sustenance training that we deliver to those people who come to the charitable organizations yep. to receive food. And why did we create NEST? Because suddenly we were delivering food to people who'd never received that kind of food nor did their chefs who were receiving that food in a charitable organization know how to prepare it. So, for example, what they were used to was bangers and mash, okay. white bread and jam, yep. and now we're bringing them wagyu beef, bok choy, aubergine, beautiful <laughs> vegetables, yeah. and it didn't all need to be boiled like sausages. So we figured we need to teach people how to cook, how to purchase, how not to waste food, and how to live a sustainable life, mm -hmm. how to live a nutritional life. So I'll give you an example, a little story from Nest. Yeah. One of our guys was delivering a talk to local council who wanted to know about Nest, so one of our Nest presenters. Yeah. It was question time, and he sees at the back of the room a little person's hand go up and then go down, and then go up and then go down. And finally, he says, did, did you have something you wanted to say? So she stands up and she says, yeah. I went through the NEST program twice. I was in a refuge for battered wives. She said the NEST program gave me the confidence to know that I could cook, that I could look after myself and go out. And I got a job and now I'm working. That's not brilliant. So we know that it's so powerful. Fantastic. Yeah, it's, it's been measured to have a social return on investment of about $9 for every dollar Brilliant. that's invested in that program. Yeah. And we're completely philanthropically funded, other than my new venture, which is the For Purpose Co., which is to yeah. create business to sustain Oz Harvest. So for us, any investment in Oz Harvest, we're very mindful to make sure of the value that we can give back. Um, for those who have desires to run fully philanthropic um, social businesses in the community, what advice would you give and what steps are vital for success? So what's vital for success is having an idea that is going to bring value. And I, I say that not lightly mm. because just to create a philanthropic business for the sake of it is not as valuable, but is as long as that impact is going to be valuable. You need to surround yourself with smart, wise counsel yep. and know that creating a board of such people is hugely important. And you need to be passionate and you need to have courage and resilience because if you believe that it is going to deliver goodness in some form or another, then there is value to bringing it to life and not being swayed by people who say, That'll never work. Yeah. Don't listen to them. Don't listen to them. Stick yeah. with it. Brilliant. Ronnie, that's all we have time for. But thank you so much. It it's really is an inspirational and very so admirable what you've done. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thanks, I Ronnie. have an amazing team around me that make me look good. Brilliant. Thanks very much. That's all we have time for. And the new investors, tune in next time.